Florida State Prison was built in 1960, and inside its walls are almost 1,200 inmates, most of them under maximum security lockup. Outside the prison, in between the rows of fencing, guard dogs patrol. Inside, all visitors and employees are screened by modern electronic metal detectors. Security is tight because inside this prison are the murderers and rapists, men who have committed the most heinous, atrocious acts against their fellow men. Men considered the worst criminals in the entire system. Over 100 of them have 25-year mandatory sentences. Many have life sentences. 146 are on death row. Their penalty is the most final, death by electrocution. Robert Austin Sullivan, our wing, or death row's longest current resident, convicted November 1973 of the robbery and murder of Donald Smith. Smith, a Howard Johnson's restaurant manager in Homestead, Dade County, Florida. His body was found by two hunters in a remote marshy area in the western part of Dade County. The body was face down with his hands bound behind his back with white surgical tape. There was a large wound to the back of the victim's head. I'm 32 years old. I was convicted of first degree murder when I was 25 in 1973 in Miami. The um, charges um, that I am accused of is a robbery murder of a Howard Johnson's restaurant um, assistant manager. I've lived in Miami for about eight years. About half of that was attending the University of Miami for four years, majoring in business management. Prior to that, I lived in Belmont, Massachusetts, and Nashua, New Hampshire. How long have you been in death row? I am, at this time, the oldest person on death row by the amount of time that is served. I arrived on, on death row November 14th, 1973 which is well over 2,000 days. Where are you in the appellate process right now? What has happened on your particular case? Um, in June, Governor Graham signed my death warrant and my lawyers um, were able to secure a stay for me from Judge Jose Gonzalez in the um, Federal District Court in Fort Lauderdale. Um, next week on March the 6th, we will have an evidentiary hearing um, before the U.S. magistrate assigned to the case. Death row, I didn't know what to expect. And of course, I was just there and was, was able to casually observe down the corridor. Um, what do you do all day? Um, very little for most people. Um, we are, are confined to the cells 24 hours a day, seven days a week, um, except for showers, five minutes worth every other night, and six hours of um, exercise periods. All the remaining hours must be spent inside the cell, one man cells. Um, different people have different things to try to occupy their minds, some constructively, some not so constructively. Um, as for myself, I write an awful lot. Um, I work on my case. I correspond with over 50 people. Um, and um, I like to read. I, I try very hard to have enough to occupy my time reading and writing for about eight to ten hours every day. Is there television? Yes. Each man is provided by the state a in-cell black and white TV set, which um, is, a, is a good pacifier. It's, um, I probably watch less TV than any other man on death row because I have other type activities that I enjoy doing. But um, it's always there if I want it or need it. and. Um, it's a good pacifier. Is it a place of potential violence? We, we read and we hear that all prisons, maybe not in Florida quite so bad as, as in some other states, are, are dynamite kicks, that there are weapons, there are drugs, there are ethnic gangs. 
Um, I would say any prison in the United States, including Florida and the Florida State Prison, there is potential for violence. Do you fear for your life ever? Um, I really don't ever dwell on it that much. Um, I would. Um, I do know that from listening to people on the staff that death row at the Florida State Prison is has the less amount of violence on it than any other wing at this institution. Psychologically, Bob, how are you affected by the fact that uh, executions have resumed in Florida? How? What was it like on on death row? I'm, when when, Spink, when John Spinklink was executed, is it? Can you describe it for us? Um, my particular vantage point to the execution room or execution chamber is only about 125 feet on the hypotenuse of a right triangle, and um, so I could see just about everything, but the exact what was going on inside the room, and. Um, it bothered me very, very much at that time, and it has bothered me ever since. It was, um, you know, I knew John ever since he arrived after me in 1974, and to see someone that I knew and liked um, be legally murdered by the state um, really, really bothered me. And, um, you know, and then my own death watch was a, um, I was able to experience the anxieties and the tensions of what led up to and preceded his execution up to a point. I didn't have to go through the final hours per se, but um, it's, um, it's a mind-bending experience. I think that, that all people, whether in prison, out of prison, or whatever, whether they approve the death, death penalty or disprove the death penalty, it is a grim encounter to come up against it. You have come so close. The people on death row, what's, what would they say is a better way? We're not here to judge anybody or condemn anybody, certainly not to convict anybody. But for those people who have been given the death penalty, who have been convicted of taking another's life, what should society do? Okay, well, one of the main arguments of the death penalty is that it will potentially deter other people from committing crimes. Do you think it will? Definitely not. Um, looking at it in the abstract sense, most people who do commit crimes do it under one of two sets of circumstances. One it's, um, is a passion type emotional thing and that is a spur of the moment thing and no penalty whatsoever will enter into their minds. The other um, area are people who don't think they're going to be caught and I have never known anyone who doesn't think he's going to be caught. The end result will not deter them from anything. Mm -hmm. Therefore the whole principle of capital punishment as postulated by the politicians is a total sham. A farce. That's a, a farce, unbelievable farce. It's a cheap way for the politicians to appease their constituency um, that they're doing something about crime. But the way to get crime is not after the fact, but before the fact. And that's the only way that you will get to deter crime, not by some mm -hmm. abstract punishment that people don't think they're ever going to get. Mm -hmm. um, looking at John Spinkling's execution, um, what purpose did it serve? man was legally murdered. The murder rates in Florida immediately after that and the quarter after that rose. I would think with all the media exposure that that execution drew, I, I, and I don't think it'll ever be that great again, if there was going to be a effect that the, that the politicians are um, um, trying to tell people that will occur, it would have occurred immediately after that execution. But the murder rates rose by a appreciable percent. I believe in Miami they went up something like 13 percent, which to me is a large percent. In the course of this program, um, we, we treat the death penalty back from its beginning, in which years ago, prior to 1924, I think, uh, defendants were tried, judged, 
and penalties carried out in their own communities. Now it is very removed from their own communities. It's, a very, as you said, a very abstract thing. It's a thing that the public can get no awareness of because how many of us can come to death row and talk with you? Uh, very few. Would, do you think that people would have a, a better understanding or a greater aversion to or pay more attention to the death penalty if executions were televised? Do you think um, there should be? Well, Gary, from my, my particular vantage point, I have said that um, if I were ever executed, I would not object to my execution being televised. I'm sure there'd be a lot of people who would, you know, um, want to see something like, ha that, like that happen. They're very bloodthirsty. Um, I think the people in the middle of the spectrum, some people like death, death penalty, some people do not, but I think the people in the middle would be affected by something like that where they would not want it as part of the criminal justice system. Um, back in England, is, um, they used to have executions out in the public and an interesting irony that I um, have always enjoyed about the death penalty is that when people were hung for committing um, various crimes such as pickpocketing, there would be pickpockets in the working crowd, the were working in the crowd at an execution for other pickpockets. Uh, I seemingly because of that, the deterrence effect is non-existent. Bob, we're almost out of time, and this is frustrating because we've just really begun. But I want to leave time for you to volunteer anything that I have not thought to ask you about that you think might be meaningful to us. There's so much that could be said. Um, I think that um, if people were to look at the death penalty in the sense that um, if it was their brother or their son, or their father, um, their husband or um, wife. There are women on death row in the United States, including one in Florida. That um, And look at it in that sense of what the families must go through of the people on death row, that um, that would be a different perspective. That it's a, um, I have a sympathy for the families of the victims of crime, but there are also families of the people on death row that I hear very little about. And um, it's a um, long, tortuous ordeal for the families of people on death row to keep coming here and going through the ups and downs of the criminal justice system through the years on death row. And um, I would hope that they might consider it in that vein. Dane T. Gafford, convicted November 1975 in Bay County, Florida, for the murder of James Holloway. The victim was found stuffed in a closet at a deserted house in West Bay. Death was by choking. Dane Gafford, then 17 years old, and four teenage girls were later apprehended in the victim's car with his money on their way to California. There's been mornings, nights, days that you just have to really pinch yourself to say, is this really happening? He expressed and expressed many times to the jury that I wouldn't even die in the chair. Mr. Leo Jones Dixon's attorney, district attorney, he expressed many times to the jury that, that um, um, I would probably never die in the chair because at that time they didn't have it. And um, but in July, around July the second, I think they brought the chair back in '76. I'm faced with it now. I wonder if the chair would have been there in '75 if they was planning on using it in '75. Would my jury ever gave it to me? Because. 
Where are you now, Dane, in the appellate process? Where do you stand? I'm still in the Florida Supreme Court. Mm -hmm. I've been in there uh, be four years in October. Mm -hmm. What is life like for you on uh, cell block R? Is that yeah, it's R wing? R wing. What is it like? Um, it's hard to explain. Many people's asked me in letters and stuff, and it's just hard to explain. I mean, how do you pass the time? Well, when I first got here, I only got letters from family and friends. And I started putting my name in other pen pal, but most of the time, if you tell people your own death row in a letter, they don't write back. And that, I say 85% of them won't write back. Why is that? Uh, they're scared. Scared of you? They or? don't understand it. Uh-huh. And, uh, I mean, but my be the best people I write right now are in prison in different states. Mm -hmm. um, I write, I confess my sins, mm -hmm. I've become religious. Mm -hmm. um, what is a what is a better way, Dane? Uh, we're not here to judge you guilty or not guilty. We're not here to even discuss your case. We're, we're talking about the death penalty. If you were not in prison, if you were not on death row, and you read and you heard about the crime rates today, and you've been here now, maybe you know a better way. What? How, how should society feel about um, it? There's too many stiff collars, workers, in high office. I mean, like judges and stuff. Like when I first got here, my ambition was always to help younger kids, juveniles. And I wanted to try to tell them, uh, like if, what it's like here. Try to explain it best way I can. I can't do it in just one letter. It might take 10 letters or more. And um, tell them that it don't take a big man to get in prison or do what anybody done to get in prison. It doesn't take, it just takes a little, a little misguidance from other people. And uh, they think, like, I've, even when I was a kid, younger, you'd, you'd say, come on, mom, dad, or somebody, take me somewhere there's nothing to do. Mm -hmm. It's boring. Mm -hmm. There's really blank nothing to do on death row. Mm -hmm. I mean, you have a TV, a radio, and you can, that's if you have somebody send you this. A state gives us TV. But the t uh, radios, letters, and stuff like that, you've got to have somebody before you even can get your head back, you know, straighten up anymore. And, uh... How did you feel when John Spinkelink, what was it like in the cell block then? Uh, sad. A lot of people was quiet because right after the execution. I mean, everybody hollered and fought for let John know we had support for him. We was trying to give, we can't do nothing. I mean, there was a, nothing a person could do, an but, inmate. But then people who are watching us now, who, or when this goes to air, are going to say, you know, with the crime rate like it is now, if things were turned around, you could be a victim yourself yeah. if you were outside. Everybody's potentially a victim. Yes. Um, what is the answer to all of it? If they have to look around to other states that don't have the electric chair and their crime rate is, is just as high. You don't think it's a deterrent? No, ma'am. Um, I think if somebody is downright guilty and they get in the chair, it's wrong, it's still wrong. 
because killing him ain't gonna solve nothing. It ain't gonna solve, it might solve having him back out on the street, but what's gonna solve the guy that's fixing to come in to take his place? Um, if, when a person goes to do a crime, he don't think, well, what, if, what will I get if, if I do this? Mm -hmm. Because it's a split notion thing when you do anything. Mm -hmm. uh, try like getting up in the morning. Your first, your first idea is to raise up. That's about the same thing with crime. Are you saying that it's a moment of, of passion that you? Um, it's not anything you you think about. It's enough. I mean, you don't even think about the time part. About getting caught. No. You, um, you, you don't. All you think about, what am I going to get out of it for myself? Mm -hmm. You don't think of uh, how much time you're going to get if you're going to prison or nothing like that. There ain't nobody here can say that I know I was going to get caught. Mm -hmm. And uh, oh, Is life dangerous on death row? Are there weapons? Are there drugs? Uh, Do you ever feel that your life is in danger? No. Uh, every guy back here is all fighting for the same thing, and that's to get off death row. Is there a closeness among you because of uh, this? We have some weird, I mean, off the wall sense of humor back there. And, and uh, like anybody from the streets come in and hear us, some of the jokes we tell, they really think we're crazy because uh, some off the wall stuff. Like what have you got and, to but, lose? But that, but, That's all we have. Mm -hmm. And uh, how long did it take you to adjust to to the actual fact that you were there? How long was there? Were there points in time at which you wondered if you ever would, if you would lose your sanity? There's been mornings, nights, days that you just have to really paint pinch yourself to say, is this really happening? I want to give you an opportunity, just maybe for a minute, to, if, to tell us anything that I might have not asked you about or anything that you want to share that, that I didn't ask you about. Um, the only really thing that I would like to say is there's people out there that support us. I mean, what I mean by support, trying to show other people that this death sentence part is wrong. Um, we need other kind of help other than an electric chair. A chair ain't, a chair is not uh, a bolt of electricity going through your body. I mean, I want to live, and every man back there wants to live. And uh, the death penalty is wrong. Dennis Manford Whitney, now 37 years old, has been at Florida State Prison 20 years, longer than any current prisoner. Whitney spent 12 and one half years on death row, but was saved from electrocution by Furman versus Georgia, in which the United States Supreme Court ruled that the imposition and carrying out of the death penalty was unconstitutional. As a result of the Furman decision, the death sentences of 631 inmates in America were vacated, including that of Dennis Whitney on Florida's death row. In Whitney versus State, the state says that Whitney freely confessed to killing a service station attendant in the course of a robbery on February 29, 1960. He first shot the victim through the face. The man fell, but the wound was not fatal. Whitney then methodically fired a second slug into the back of the head of the fallen man. Dennis Whitney described to me, off camera but in a tape recording, how he killed a woman who refused to give up her automobile to him. He said she hit him in the head with a hammer, whereupon he shot her. He is said to have committed several other killings in a robbery murder spree from California to Florida, but he was convicted and sentenced for two murders in the state of Florida. One reason I would never be able to commit a murder again is because 
I've realized that it's not a single solitary act. Instead of wanting to get out, like when they first came here, they wanted to get out. Now when they get out, subconsciously they actually want to come back because this is where their friends are, this is where their, their life is. They've this become is. thoroughly institutionalized. Right. Now, this is, this is one of the causes, one of the causes for your very high recidivism rate. And the men don't actually, you know, they don't say this to themselves consciously, it's a subconscious thing. Uh, they, they don't admit to themselves, I want to go back to prison because, you know, you say that, well, you're nuts. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but this is uh, one, of, one, of, one of the factors that, that causes the high recidivism rate. It's very, on it. I see men who've just gotten out of prison, six months later they're back, and you see them setting out in this cage out front, mm -hmm. and the work squads be coming in, you know. And they'd be seeing their friends, hey, 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 and, uh, you know, they're actually happy to see each like other. Like coming home. Yeah, it's like coming home. And, uh... You've been involved, you are involved in a lot of programs and things, uh... What is a good word besides programs? Uh, you're well... You're active here in the prison. You're, you're, you're right. really actively involved in a lot of things, so... I guess I've been involved in just about everything they have that you want to call programs. Mm -hmm. Uh, this, pr this prison didn't always have programs. It was built and designed as a maximum security prison. No prison farm type. Right. And it was built strictly for your incorrigibles, your violent criminals, your uh, high escape risk and everything. But the problem is they built a prison to hold a thousand inmates and you don't have that many men to be in a maximum security prison. How long were you on death row, Dennis? Uh, twelve and a half years. That many right. years? Well, now for a little over twelve. I come, I come on death row on July first, in 1960, and I got off death row in September '72 behind the Furman versus Georgia decision. Total confinement all that time. Right, 24 hours a day confinement. How'd you keep your sanity? Uh, by keeping my mind active. Oh, uh, actually, death row was a good experience for me since you know I didn't get executed because it, it gave me the, the time and the opportunity to reflect and to study to try to understand myself. Just how you know, did I get? How here? old were you when you were convicted? Seventeen. Seventeen. And so I started. I spent most of my time on death row, reading, studying. Uh, I also developed a natural talent I had for art, and just keeping keeping my mind active. Uh, it drives a lot of men batty because they don't know how to occupy their mm -hmm. time. Fortunately, I was I was able to. I have not had an active mind, but uh, it had a lot of effects on me, which I didn't appreciate until I got off the death row. I had become as a man becomes institutionalized to a cell, I had become institutionalized to a cell like a man becomes to a prison. Uh, I become attached to Your that 24 hour small. confinement. Mm -hmm. And when I got off death row and got out in this population here, it was quite an experience. It took me about a year, a good year to adjust and be able to function just in this prison. With after other people. Yeah, you know, after being confined in that one cell for 12 years, mm -hmm. it was a tremendous adjustment for me to come out of that into this population. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I can imagine what it's going to be like when I come out of prison into, into society after uh -huh. 20 years. You know. Dennis, having been on death row and now having been in the general population, what, for how many years? Uh, eight years now. Eight, right? Death row, 12 years out in the general population for eight years and now having become very active in all the things that you do and, and being a useful member of the society here in the prison tell us if you will your thoughts on the death penalty the executions have started again of course
for there's 146 people up there. Is there a better way? <laughs> uh, a better way for what? This depends on what your aim and your purpose is. Myself, if we are truly a civilized society that's based on Christian humanitarian principles, there is no place for capital punishment. The only way I could bring myself to accept capital punishment, and I would not support it for this reason, but at least I could accept it, is if we are honest about what it is. Be honest about what we are doing. And capital punishment is nothing more or less than vengeance. You have hurt me, so I am going to hurt you. It's an eye and eye and tooth for a tooth. Otherwise, it has, there is no social redeeming value to it. Some people try to rationalize or to excuse it, saying deterrence. You don't think it is? Absolutely not. There is no, the, the idea of deterrence, anyone who claims deterrence has very little understanding of human nature and what motivates human behavior. I know that smoking can give me cancer, emphysema, heart attack, you name it, and I'm still, still smoking, smoking two packs a day. I know that uh, if I drink and drive, you know, I can get killed, but how many people are drinking and driving? It's not stopping them, it's not a deterrence. You know that if you speed, you're going to get a ticket. Okay, if you happen to pass a policeman, well, you'll slow down and drive carefully for a little while, but as soon as you feel safe again, you're going to speed again. So, what it is, is God's been wise enough to give us the ability to deceive ourselves that we are somehow infallible or exempt from all the accidents which befall man, you know, that uh, lightning might strike you and it might strike you, but it's not going to strike me. If we didn't believe that uh, we were somehow not going to have these things happen to us, life would be very morbid, you know. We wouldn't do nothing. We would live, we would exist in a state of fear. I can't do this because of this possible consequence or that possible consequence. So all these misfortunes in life happen to other people. They never happen to us. Other people get cancer, not me, you know. Uh, other people lose their jobs, not me. So you're saying that criminals so, say other people will get caught, not me. Right. They, they don't actually verbalize this. When I was committing my crimes, I never considered, even considered the thought of whether or not I was going to get caught. Didn't matter? You, I just, just didn't give it the thought. Inconceivable. Mm -hmm. And not consciously. Mm -hmm. But any act we do, we do with the idea that we're going to succeed. Anything we do, whether it's legitimate or illegitimate, a positive or negative act, we do it with the idea, psychologically, that we can succeed in doing it. In committing a crime, when I go out to commit a crime, it doesn't matter if it's going to be a robbery, a burglary, or murder, or whatever the crime is. Subconsciously, I'm doing it with the idea that I'm going to succeed, I'm going to get away with it, not with that I'm going to get caught. Mm -hmm. So the consequences of getting caught are totally irrelevant. It doesn't matter if the consequences is a slap on the hand, five years in prison, or a death sentence. If I ever considered that I'm going to get caught, I wouldn't commit the act in the first place. Any consequence would be a deterrent. You know, if I knew I was going to get caught, I wouldn't want to spend a year in prison no more than I want to be executed. Are you saying, though, that that nothing that, that society has fashioned as a punishment works as a deterrent? The degree, Not even a the degree of punishment, the degree of punishment is not the deterrence. Mm -hmm. The deterrence lies in the certainty of being caught mm -hmm. uh, and convicted. Mm -hmm. The higher the risk of being caught or convicted, like if, if you live in an area where you have very effective 
uh, patrol the highways, you have less speeders because you're aware We hear of so this. many times, Dennis, we hear so many times of men on death row who say, execute me now if you're going to, don't put me through this long appeals procedure, but they don't really mean it, do they? Definitely. Uh, do they mean it? The What happens back on death row, I, when I came here, executions were what, very active. Was there active. a time when you felt right. that way? The first three years I was here, you know, I, I witnessed 12 executions and came very near to being executed myself. Mm -hmm. Now, when I first came here, one of the men told me he'd been on death row five and a half years, you know, and he was my cell partner. Mm -hmm. was, they hadn't built the East Unit yet. It was mm -hmm. a, I was in the old death house and they had two man cells. And he was the first man I seen executed. It was my cell partner. And when they actually came toward him his death warrant and he knew he was going to be executed, I saw something that I found very hard to understand. I couldn't believe it because there seemed to be a great sense of relief. Like a tremendous burden had been lifted off his shoulders. Mm -hmm. And he was very calm. And boy, this blew my mind, you know, because here's this guy fixing to be, and instead of me trying to comfort him, he was actually trying to comfort mm -hmm. me because I was the one being upset by his mm -hmm. being executed. So, the, so the, the years, so, many years in a prison cell would have been a greater punishment to him than death? No, not being in prison, one is being on death row. Here's what happens. A man's emotions are played with, his nerves played with like a yo-yo. His hopes are constantly going up and down, up and down. He lives in a constant state of uncertainty and anxiety. He never knows what tomorrow's going to bring, you know. And it just the anxiety. more, yeah, the 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 nervous anxiety and constantly, you know, his hopes get raised, and appeal gets denied, and he goes down. It's rather up and know the worst than not to know it all. And you reach a point. And I reached that point so I can understand it. You finally reach a point after so many years of it and going through so many appeals, you finally reach a point where you just want it to be over with no matter what. Either a new trial or a commutation or an execution, you just want it to be over with. You want to know something definite. And I experienced this when I thought I was going to be executed in, in 63. My warrant had been signed and I came to within a day of being executed and I, I experienced the sense of relief. Well, finally, you know, at least finally it's, it's over with one way or another. And it really doesn't matter which way, just so it's over with. Um, and this is the real torture that actually the, the execution itself is anticlimactic. Uh, the worst part of it is the years, the ritual, the process the man goes through. That is pro that perhaps is even more inhuman than the execution itself. In Florida in particular now, Dennis, there are, is controversy rages in particular since the Spinkle Lake execution over capital punishment. And for those people who oppose capital punishment, there are those who say, but what do you say to the family of the victim? This, this argument. Um, Help us with that. Help us to... I think the victims of crime, not only of capital crimes, but of all crimes, are double victims. I think they're very badly neglected and ill-considered by our judicial system, the by our society. All the focus is on the criminal mm -hmm. himself. Mm -hmm. And af often the victim is victimized by the judicial process, mm -hmm. so he becomes a double victim. I think we need to give more consideration to the victims. Society has a responsibility too, and I think some responsibility should be placed upon the criminal to, to be reimbursed where possible. Mm -hmm. Of course, in 
cases such as murder or rape, there's no way of making compensation you or can't reimbursement. Write. One reason I would never be able to commit a murder again is because I've realized that it's not a single solitary act. You know, when I kill you, that's not the end of the act. The ones who really suffer and continue to suffer are the living. Mm -hmm. Your family, the people who knew you, the people who loved you, who depended on you, I have hurt them even as much, if not more, than I've hurt you when I've killed you. They're the ones who truly suffer. So even if you deserve to die, you know, maybe you've done something that maybe I have a valid, I can rationalize and say, well, you've hurt, done something enough to me that you deserve to die. Mm -hmm. But by killing you, it's not just you. It's all, it affects hundreds of people. Mm -hmm. So it's not isolated. I never appreciated this before. I've just come to appreciate this. That there are consequences far beyond the single solitary act where many people suffer. And I think for this same reason is another reason we shouldn't have capital punishment. We heard that from one defendant. When today. you execute me, you're not really punishing me. No. You know, because when I'm in the, in the grave, I feel no sense of loss, no sense of suffering, no, I don't... You're not I'm, not I'm not being hurt, mm -hmm. but the living are, mm -hmm. you know. My family... People who love you. ...love me mm -hmm. just as much as the families of the victims love them. Mm -hmm. And I don't think, by executing me, you are lessening their suffering any, or their loss any. It does not make the dead any less dead. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't lessen the suffering or the loss of the living any. We so have instead of you know having an answer to the problem, you're actually compounding mm -hmm. the problem. Have any hopes of getting out? Eventually, yes. I hope to get out. And I hope to get out much sooner than they're talking about. Mm -hmm. They're talking about letting me out in 96 right now, another 16, 16 years. years. Do you think you can uh, function on the outside after that many years? Uh, it would be very difficult. If I was turned out right now today, I would have a tremendous adjustment problem. The world, you know, has just totally changed in the 20 years I've been out there. And keeping me in here longer is not going to make it any easier. Uh, actually, if I stayed in prison another 15 years, I doubt if I would want out. Uh, there would be nothing for me to go out to. Do you think you... The, the, there are a lot of people who would say, no, you mustn't let him out now. Uh, he's, how many life sentences? You had a life sentence and a death sentence? Right, so now I have two life sentences. But can staying any longer make you a better person? I don't think staying in, keeping me in any longer will make me any better person. On the contrary, uh, I'm not saying whether I'm a good or bad person, Let's say staying any longer is not going to help me be any more productive in society. Mm -hmm. It's going to be detrimental towards that. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not benefiting society in, in any way unless, of course, they feel I'm still dangerous. That's. But uh, the, just the peer retribution aspect. How could you assure them that you're not? Uh, nobody can be absolutely sure. Mm -hmm. You're going to make mistakes in judgment. Mm -hmm. The only thing they can possibly judge on is my present behavior as compared to my past behavior, mm -hmm. whether they have noticed any change. Well, in 20 years in prison, I haven't committed any violent acts. Everything I've done has been positive, constructive. constructive. So this is, you know, if any person was to make the judgment, and naturally, I want out, so I'm going to tell you, well, oh, I'm going to be a great A citizen, <laughs> uh -huh. I'm not going to spit on the sidewalk, I'm going to go to church every Sunday, right. <laughs> and, you know, I can run a good reel on you, because I'm able to speak well, mm -hmm. and convincingly, Right. and if I go out there and, and commit the other crime, you really can't fault anybody for their judgment, because everything I've done has indicated 
that I will do well outside. Uh, but they're turning people out every day who everything they do indicates that they're going to commit crimes again. Mm -hmm. You know, they continue to rob and steal while in prison. Uh, they are not doing anything to better themselves or to change their ways. You know, they're, they're just as much criminals in prison as they were outside of prison. Their behavior is a continuation in here of what it was outside. And it should be obvious that when you turn them out, it's going to be a continuation again. And yet they're turning them loose every day. So the problem is that they really have no criteria or are rarely following no criteria for keeping men in prison or letting them out of prison other than pure and simple retribution. Mm -hmm. Make them do so much time. Beth, I had really faced the philosophical question of the appropriateness of the death penalty prior to being elected governor. First, as a member of the state senate, uh, I voted to restore the death penalty in Florida. That was the question of whether it was an appropriate public policy or not. Then, as a candidate for governor, I knew that I would take an oath of office that I would enforce all the laws of Florida, including the capital punishment. I would not have offered myself uh, as a candidate for governor unless I was prepared to do so. However, when it came to the first time, I know it must have been very difficult. Yes, uh, it's like a lot of other things in life when you convert from the general theory of something down to its application in a specific case to a specific specific human being, it takes on a different dimension. Uh, I established in my own mind some standards by which this matter would should be uh, approached. One was that we should assure that the individual had received every possible due process in terms of having uh, a trial that uh, met those standards, an appeal, in almost all cases an appeal to the United States Supreme Court. Uh, second, that if there were circumstances that warranted commutation, if there were circumstances that justified mercy, uh, to be prepared to do so. But third, if there were no such standards, that there was nothing to be gained, no ends of justice were served by unending procrastination delay. And so I would sign death warrants. Uh, to date, I have signed eight death warrants, uh, have recommended commutation in three cases. All the inmates we talked with on death row say that the death penalty is not a deterrent, but none of them offered an alternative to capital punishment, even though we kept pressing them for a better way if the death penalty is indeed not the answer. You've heard from many people, I'm sure, since the Spinkle Inc. execution. Does the public still seem to strongly support the death penalty? The... Uh polls that uh, you read indicate that there is a, uh, a strong public uh, feeling that capital punishment is an appropriate uh, uh, social policy for Florida uh, in those cases in which there has been a taking of a life with, a, with an opportunity for premeditated thought about the consequences of that. In this article we dealt with the fact that uh, punishment has been moved out of the community in 1924 when uh, death by electrocution became the law and the Florida State Prison became the location. Prior to that, all punishment was in the community in which the crime was committed. Occasionally, someone comes up with a suggestion that it will not be a deterrent unless the public actually sees it. We're rather far removed from it now. Uh, what would be your thoughts on that? Well, I would not favor that. I think that would add another dimension of emotional uh, layer to an already highly emotionalized situation. Uh, the reality is that whereas in 1924 when they used to have capital punishment by hanging in the courthouse square of the county in which the crime took place, uh, the means of communication were such that only a relatively few people could uh, see what was happening, although they saw it personally. Today we have instantaneous international communications and although uh, even a smaller group of people see it in person, the impact of the, of the event uh, is an international event, as we saw in the John Spinkling case. So in terms of bringing home 
to people the implications of capital punishment as a deterrent, I would say that it's even greater today in an isolated room in Rayford than it was 50 or 60 years ago in the courthouse square. The inmates that we talk with say that the most brutal aspect of death row is <clears throat> not really the contemplation of the actual execution, and I really pushed hard on this, that they say, go ahead and execute me rather than keep me here forever with these constant appeals. Do they really mean it? And they said, yes, indeed, that it's, it's better than, and as one put it, playing with a man's emotions. I don't see any way to deal with the fundamental problem of a long period of time between the trial and the final completion of all judicial remedies. Uh, the system provides really four uh, layers of review. You have the direct appeal from the jury uh, finding and sentence uh, through the state system, followed by another appeal through the federal system. Then you have a habeas corpus appeal through the state system, followed by a habeas corpus appeal through the federal system. And the way in which the process has operated uh, in the last couple of years, those last two appeals don't typically start until a death warrant is signed. Are you very bothered by the fact that there are 140 people left up there, and should you serve an additional term as governor, maybe eight years, that you will have to face the possibility of signing that many death warrants? That is not a prospect that would make any person uh, uh, have emotions other than those of personal uh, concern. Uh, Can you cope with it? But I am perfectly prepared to cope with it. We're, the important thing to me is to not think of it as 140 cases, but to think of it as each individual case being judged on its own merits. And that's the process that we've tried to follow. Uh, we consider each of these after they have completed their first state and federal appeals uh, and they have been denied. Uh, we have a full uh, review by the State Probation and Parole Commission, then a full hearing by all the members of the cabinet plus myself sitting as the clemency board. At that point, with all that information, with all that judicial record, we make a decision. We'll be prepared to make as many decisions as we're called upon. This is old Sparky, Florida's electric chair. Its most recent occupant, John Spinkle Inc., May 25th, 1979, 10:18 a.m. A hooded executioner in the small room to the right of the chair turns the switch, and anywhere between two to eight minutes later, the condemned is pronounced dead by a doctor. And according to the law, justice has been served. is a good pacifier. It's, um, I probably watch less TV than any other man on death row because I have other type activities that I enjoy doing. But um, it's always there if I want it or need it. And um, it's a good pacifier. Is it a place of potential violence? We, we read and we hear that all prisons, maybe not in Florida quite so bad as, as in some other states, are or dynamite kicks, that there are weapons, there are drugs, there are ethnic gangs. 
Um, I would say any prison in the United States, including Florida and the Florida State Prison, there is potential for violence. Do you fear for your life ever? Um, I really don't ever dwell on it that much. Um, I would, um, I do know that from listening to people on the staff that death row at the Florida State Prison is, has the less amount of violence on it than any other wing at this institution. Psychologically, Bob, how are you affected by the fact that uh, executions have resumed in Florida? How, what was it like on, on death row um, when, when, Spink, when John Spinklink was executed? Is it, can you describe it for us? Um, my particular vantage point to the execution room or execution chamber is only about a hundred. Part of Dade County. The body was face down with his hands bound behind his back with white surgical tape. There was a large wound to the back of the victim's head. I'm 32 years old. I was convicted of first degree murder when I was 25 in 1973 in Miami. The um, charges um, that I am accused of is a robbery murder of a Howard Johnson's restaurant um, assistant manager. I've lived in Miami for about eight years. About half of that was attending the University of Miami for four years majoring in business management. Prior to that I lived in Belmont, Massachusetts and Nashua, New Hampshire. How long have you been in death row? I am at this time the oldest person on death row by the amount of time that is served. I arrived on, on death row November 14th, 1973, which is well over 2,000 days. Where are you in the appellate process right now? What has happened in your particular case? Um, in June, Governor Graham signed my death warrant and my lawyers um, were able to secure a stay for me from Judge Jose Gonzalez in the um, Federal District Court in Fort Lauderdale. State Prison was built in 1960, and inside its walls are almost 1,200 inmates, most of them under maximum security lockup. Outside the prison, in between the rows of fencing, guard dogs patrol. Inside, all visitors and employees are screened by modern electronic metal detectors. Security is tight because inside this prison are the murderers and rapists, men who have committed the most heinous, atrocious acts against their fellow men men considered the worst criminals in the entire system. Over 100 of them have 25-year mandatory sentences. Many have life sentences. 146 are on death row. Their penalty is the most final, death by electrocution. Robert Austin Sullivan, our wing, or death row's longest current resident, convicted November 1973 of the robbery and murder of Donald Smith. Smith, a Howard Johnson's restaurant manager in Homestead, Dade County, Florida. His body was found by two hunters in a remote marshy area in the western part of the um, Next week on March the 6th, we will have an evidentiary hearing um, before the U.S. magistrate assigned to the case. Death Row, I didn't know what to expect, and of course, I was just there and was, was able to casually observe down the corridor. Um, what do you do, Aldo? Um, very little for most people. Um, we are, are confined to the cells 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 
um, except for showers, five minutes worth every other night, and six hours of um, exercise periods. All the remaining hours must be spent inside the cell, one man cells. Um, different people have different things to try to occupy their minds, some constructively, some not so constructively. Um, as for myself, I write an awful lot. Um, I work on my case. I correspond with over 50 people. Um, and um, I like to read. I, I try very hard to have enough to occupy my time reading and writing for about eight to ten hours every day. Is there television? Yes. Each man is provided by the state a in-cell black and white TV set, which um, is 125 feet on the hypotenuse of a right triangle. And um, so I could see just about everything but the exact, uh, what was going on inside the room. And um, it bothered me very, very much at that time, and it has bothered me ever since. It was, um, you know, I knew John ever since he arrived after me in 1974, and to see someone that I knew and liked um, be legally murdered by the state um, really, really bothered me. And, um, you know, and then my own death watch was a, um, I was able to experience the anxieties and the tensions of what led up to and preceded his execution up to a point. I didn't have to go through the final hours per se. But um, it's, um, it's a mind-bending experience. I think that, that all people, whether in prison, out of prison, or whatever, whether they approve the death, death penalty or disprove the death penalty, it is a grim encounter to come up against it. You have come so close. The people on death row What's, what would they say is a better way? We're not here to judge anybody or condemn anybody, certainly not to convict anybody, but for those people who have been given